Hello and welcome to Gardening of 58 North. So in this video I'd like to give you guys a tour of my parents' garden. So this is a garden that I made a video series about last year. I focused on the vegetables mainly but also a few other parts of the garden. And I made a video about every couple of weeks. I would have liked to have done that video series again this year but it just takes so long to edit all the videos and for the number of people who watch them it was just taking up too much time. So this year I'm just going to do one or two videos. I'll probably put this in a two part because this will be quite a long tour. But this is basically an end of summer tour of the garden. This is round about the time of year when the garden looks at its best normally. So I'll start here at the top. So we've got the house on the left and we've got this kind of top area which is uh, slightly raised. But basically this garden was completely empty nine years ago when my parents first moved in. It was just a big green lawn and there was a row of Leylandi at the back which were very small. There was nothing else at all. Apart from this raised bed which had a couple of small lavender plants and one or two other plants. But basically it was an empty garden so all the plants I'm sowing apart from a few lavenders here have all grown in those nine years. So we've got some huge lavender plants here. This one is, is particularly large now. The bees absolutely love it. You can see there's loads of bees on it at the moment flying around. Normally bumblebees we have quite a few different species of bumblebees but we also have some honeybees as well. Really popular with the bees. All the lavenders are in this garden. There's a few other shrubs here. Nothing to, of, of much note really apart from the St John's wort and the lavender. So this garden is roughly divided into two. We've got kind of like an ornamental area and then we've got more of a vegetable production area. The vegetable production is certainly a lot bigger than the ornamental area and also to be honest half the ornamental area is actually fruit trees so it's mainly a, a vegetable and food garden, but I'll take you down here to this area and I'll start talking about this section. So the biggest feature in the garden is probably this row of willow here. These are hybrid willow that I planted, I think it was about six or seven years ago now. And the idea with this is it's a windbreak. This garden here is right on the north coast of Scotland. There's nothing to really stop the wind coming off the North Sea and we can get a hundred mile an hour wind sometimes. The garden is actually 30 meters up on top of a cliff and the sea is only about one or 200 meters away. So there's nothing to stop the winds coming in and in really bad weather we can even get foam from the sea that blows into the garden and the salt burns everything. So it's very exposed so the idea here is to get this windbreak put up. So it runs north to south, the reason for that is it doesn't cast much shade but it still gives us plenty of protection and as the predominant winds tend to be from the west it also protects us from the westerly winds. So that's what the willow's for. We also have it just as a nice feat so you can hear it rustling in the wind at the moment and we also have a couple of interesting willow arches. I did, I have done a few videos about this. What I do every year is I pollard every other plant and so none of these branches are more than two years old. They're pollarded down to about a meter in height and that way we get loads of wood material for, for chipping and we can chip that and use it on our paths in the garden and we can also use it for stakes and you'll see later on for vegetables or, or sunflowers we can sate them and keep them secure. So these are the, the willows anyway. We've got this old willow arch here which has grown up quite nicely now and takes us through to the vegetable garden beyond. This one's uh, quite a tight archway, quite mature and I'll take you now to the other one. So this is the other willow archway, about a year younger than that last one. I think they're both only about four years old quite young willow archways. This one here is a lot wider and it's kind of informal at the left here. I've purposely done that and then I have it going tighter and more formal along the side there but they're both very mature and actually I could probably hang off this with my full weight. It's that solid now it's really a quite a well-grown in structure. So that's the willows anyway, a nice feature to have in the garden. Underneath we've got a mixture of shrubs, none are terribly exciting so I don't think I'll really talk much about them. It's a mixture of shrubs and herbaceous plants just around the edge. They look best a bit more in early summer so at the moment there's not much in flower. We have got lavateria over there which is flowering away though. Apart from that and the achillea over here we don't really have much in flower at the moment. But if I pan around now, I'll take you to the woodland garden. So this is a fruit orchard and the idea is eventually to get enough fruit trees in here that it becomes shaded on the ground and I'm going to plant it out with lots of woodland plants. At the moment it's a wildflower meadow with some spring bulbs. So we've got quite a nice display of spring bulbs in the springtime. And then we get a lot of yellow rattle and wildflower throughout the summer. But then it kind of finishes and by this time of year it, it doesn't look particularly nice. You can see there's a lot of this yellow rattle has died off. And so it's just all this like dead material now so not the nicest looking at the moment it's a work in progress and the idea is once we get more shade i'll fill it up with woodland plants and i should be able to have color year round with the, the right selection of plants so the main trees here are the apple trees there's two large ones over there this one here will also be a large one and we've also got a miniature one in the background we've got two damsons this is one of the few original trees to the garden although this one was very small when we first moved in 
we've got a second damson there and then we've got an edible cherry in the background so I'll take you through now so you a few of the plants this is also where my contorted hazel went from my garden I transplanted this about two or three years ago now I've got a video about that if, if you're interested you'll also see a few young paulonia trees that I planted I grew these from seed uh, they've only just gone in this year or, or the year before depending on which plant it is and so they've not really come to much yet what I do have though in this shady area because as well as uh, fruit trees we have fruit bushes we have currants and things in the more shady positions I've also got wasabi so this here is it's like a big shed with a large overhang what I've done is where the water runs off directly underneath it I planted a wasabi because wasabi likes damp conditions and this is going growing particularly well at the moment doesn't look too great at this time of year because the slugs have really eaten it but in spring this was really looking nice and lush with all its leaves so that wasabi has been growing out here no protection last year got really hard frosts I think about minus six minus eight in this garden and it came through no problem my garden it's a bit different I get harder frost because this is a garden right next to the coast my parents tend not to get the, the hardest of frost so more exposed but less cold in winter so I go through the rest of the garden here you can see I've got one of my moso seedlings in this section much smaller than the one in my garden because it's competing with weeds and grasses and it's not irrigated regularly like my one there's also a few more fruit bushes Coming over to the left, you'll, you'll see one or two Christmas trees in the garden. This is a Nordman fir, one of the younger out of the two. I've got, we've got one that's actually quite large now. This is the cherry tree, and I'll now take you to the apple trees. So this is the first one. This is very small. Unfortunately, it's a dwarfing rootstock. It's never going to get any bigger than this. It's pretty much at its maximum size. Some years it does really well, and there's so many apples it almost breaks itself. This year, for some reason, even though the spring was quite good, we haven't had very good fruit set, so it's quite sparse with apples at the moment. Along the back here, we've also got our comfrey patch, which we use for fertilizing garden with. That's in a sod wall made out of turf, just to keep it confined, because we don't want that spreading, because once that spreads somewhere, it's very hard to dig it out, which is why we have it in the corner here on the wall. We've also got some gooseberry bushes dotted around. There's one there, one here, but they hop crop quite early, so there's no gooseberries left on them. And then I also have the viburnum that I transplanted from my garden previously and that's starting to take off this year. The first two years it didn't grow much but you see got some nice growth on it this year. It's grown at least over two foot. Now next to the viburnum we also have some lovage. This doesn't look nice at the moment because it's starting to go over but this is a really nice herb, really good for soups. Lovely really kind of, not quite aniseed but a very nice kind of smell to it. And uh, this grows huge. This grows about three meters in height every summer. We used to have two, but we took one out because it was just too big. And this is, yeah, as I say, interesting plant. Comes up very early in spring, grows to about three meters in June, July, finishes flowering, and then it kind of goes over now. But the leaves do taste very nice. So I'll now talk about the other two apple trees. So I think one of them is a cooker and one of them is an eater. I can't remember off the top of my head which is which, but I think this is a cooking apple as it's much larger. These are normally ripe later in the year, kind of September, October. Here in Scotland, we have to be careful with the apple varieties because some apples do like to ripen quite late, but if you, they ripen too late, we, we run out of the energy in the sun. Uh, September, October time, we don't get the fully ripe. So we did make sure we've got apples, which were good for our climate. They've grown really well. These aren't dwarfing ones, so these, these are gonna still get bigger. These aren't at the full size yet. And I've probably taken off about 70% of the apples so far this year, and there's still loads of apples on the tree. I have to take out a lot of the apples because if I had left them, the branches would have snapped and there would have been lots of small apples instead of large tasty ones. So you can see these ones are looking really good. In fact, they're looking like they're getting ripe, which is very early for this variety. But I think we have such nice warm weather we've had this year. That's why they're ripening. And this one here, we may have to take some more apples off still or prop up some of these branches because they're really starting to bend now with the weight of those apples. So the only other plants to mention in this, in this area is probably the, the elm tree. That was planted a few years ago. As you can see, it's growing very fast. Uh, I have to keep that well pruned. I'll probably do some kind of different pruning on it soon because it is going to get out of hand if we're not careful. So I'll take you now through to the vegetable production area. Now, the vegetable area it looks completely flat and there's nothing on the ground in early spring late winter but this time of year as you can see it's almost like a jungle so i'll also talk about when it comes to the vegetable gardens we've done it slightly differently this year so normally when it comes to our vegetables we're quite intensive and it's a lot of work a lot of maintenance this garden can probably feed four or five people for the whole year it really is very productive 
but we've just been finding that it's a huge amount of work and this last year I had my first son so I'm not able to help in the garden quite as much as usual so we decided to go for a slightly less intensive type of gardening for the vegetable garden so some of the plots are a little bit different to how they would usually look so this one here for example is one of the four vegetable plots we have because we keep them on a four year rotation and this one this year is completely planted up with Jerusalem artichokes now it might be hard to get a sense of scale but these are about three meters in height now really tall plants they're still growing as well these will give us juice from artichokes to eat the whole winter long. Last year we didn't even manage to eat them all, the crop was so great. They grow much better than potatoes. Potatoes you often get blight, although we do get good crop of potatoes. Blight can be a bit of a problem, but these they just grow the whole summer long and then in autumn and winter you get loads of um, juice from artichokes to eat. And what's great about this plant is that because it just gets so big, it just smothers everything else. So we've actually had a very dry summer and some of the plants have been a bit stunted so we've had to irrigate a little bit these weren't too stunted by the drought and the other thing is because it was dry these were sucking all the moisture out that they could and with the combination of dry and also shady you can see underneath here there's barely a single weed that's grown so that's one of the great things about growing Jerusalem artichokes is you plant them they don't have any kind of pest or disease problems or at least not in our climate here we don't touch them at all. All we do is we put some of this string up on the edges to make sure they're not blown over by the wind. They grow absolutely huge and then smother all the weeds. All we have to do at the end of the year is dig them up, eat them, and there's no weeds. And so we can plant again next year without having to worry about weeding the whole plot. The other nice thing with these is because they are three meters in height, it's a really good windbreak. This shelters the other parts of the garden. And because there's so much organic matter with these grow and they've got quite woody stems, we just chip these down and we use them to mulch the beds. So this will mulch probably more than one vegetable plot. So that will help with the weed control as well. So just to the side here, we've got a little path which is flanked by all our raspberry plants here. Now this is a lot of raspberries. I think it's about 10 meters or more, probably 15 meters in length. Um, this year they're not done as well because we had a very dry year really. And so they've not grown as big as they would normally they're often about two meters in height this year they're probably only about a meter and a half and these are autumn fruiting raspberries so you can see some of them are in flower still even though it's the last day of august today some of them are just starting to show fruit and we often still get fruit coming off of these around about december time if it's mild and this garden being next to the coast it, it, it does stay mild for a while and uh, raspberries are quite frost tolerant so minus one minus two they'll they'll keep growing they won't really stop growing until really late in the year and normally with autumn fruiting raspberries what you're supposed to do is cut them back hard at the end of the year and then let them regrow and then you have the crop at the end of the year but what we tend to do is we treat them a little bit more like the summer raspberries where we keep last year's canes that way we have to get a double cropping with these raspberries so you can see here these canes were actually the ones that fruited last autumn. Then what they do in June, July time, they send out a leather crop, which is actually slightly heavier. And we get a nice crop in June, July, and then we get a second crop in autumn time. So that way we don't have such a glut of, of raspberries. The autumn crop isn't as big as it would be if we actually prune this like you're supposed to with autumn raspberries, but it just means we get a, a nice kind of staggered crop and we get two big crops throughout the year instead of one huge one that we can't handle. So at the back of the vegetable plot, there is a little bit of ornamental. These were actually mostly already here, but they were just very small plants, so small you couldn't really notice them when we first moved in. You can see the um, hydrangea this year has done terrible. Normally this looks really nice, but there's just been such little rain this year. You can see the leaves are really tiny, really stressed, and even the flowers are very small. So unfortunately, it's really struggled this year. Now, normally our soil would be naturally acidic. You can see these are pink, so that tells you it's alkaline. The reason that is, is because my parents heat the house almost entirely from wood, from wood burning stove. So there's a lot of ash we put on the garden and that's made the soil a bit more alkaline and less acidic, which is actually helpful for our brassicas and our cabbages. So I come through here. Some more unusual oddities. I've got this uh, topiary thing that I'm working on here. The idea is it's going to be a really unusual topiary, almost like a totem pole, just like a really tall pole going up with like squares and circles and rectangles as it grows. So I've done the bottom, which is a, is a nicely pruned rectangle. And then it's going to be a clear stem for about a meter, meter and a half. Then I'll probably have a ball on it and then another meter and a half and there'll be a, a, a square, just a combination of things. And next to this is one of my favorite banana plants. So this isn't edible, this banana, because it'll be full of seeds if it did ripen. And to be honest, it's probably never going to have ripe 
bananas in our climate. But basically this is Musa sicamensis. I grew multiple plants of these from seed. This one was the most compact and wind resistant out of the lot that I grew. They were all quite varying in their genetics, so they all look quite different. And so this one I planted here because I knew this is quite a windy garden. And it's done surprisingly well. Last year it did get killed down to the ground, so this was a much bigger plant. And if I come into here, you'll see how thick the, the main stem was last year. You can see it was that one there. Really big main stem. And you can see these little ones in comparison are much smaller. So it was much bigger last year before the frost killed it back. Also this year has been so dry, it hasn't grown quite as quick as it would normally. But this does particularly well here. And what I really like about this Musa Sicamensis is it's got that lovely kind of striping on the leaves. Now there's not much of it to see here because these leaves are a bit older, more mature. But when the leaves are younger, I'll show you some photos, you get some really lovely patterning from the uh, Musa Sicamensis. At the back we've also just got some more taller shrubs like the Buddleia here and some contorted willow just to protect us from the worst of the weather because it really just blows through that gap there. Basically where those trees are in the distance round about there that's not far from the edge of the cliff so it's quite close. So I can turn around now to show you the rest of the vegetable plots. Um, this one here is a bit of a weird mixture. This is another low maintenance one that we don't normally grow but we're doing this year because we're trying to keep our workload down. So this here is a pumpkin patch. I also had loads of Insetium ventricosa and Morelii plants. So I planted about 30 of them in here. And they're looking quite nice, but they have got a bit smothered by the, the pumpkins. They are just managing to push out of the top. But the idea is here is just to have a weird kind of uh, tropical looking bed, which gives us a nice harvest of pumpkins, but we don't need to do any maintenance on. I planted this up in very early summer, and we haven't done much weeding at all because we mulched it all with lots of plant material. And once you get to this time of year, the pumpkins smother everything and there's not any weeding to do. And we just leave this now until the first frost come and then we can just collect all the pumpkins as they ripen. So very little work. We got two types of pumpkins. One that I bought from a seed company and it's a small pumpkin that's particularly bred for eating. So they're not very big but that's what you really want if you're eating pumpkins because you want to make one or two meals out of one. You don't want a giant pumpkin which you then have to make about 10, 20 meals with, and then you have to try and store it all. So it's got lots of small pumpkins so we can keep them. They'll store really well throughout the winter for several months, and that will give us a supply of pumpkins right through to the next year. So we'll start harvesting them in a month or two, and we can just store them in a frost-free location probably right through to next spring, and they'll be absolutely fine. So we have, that, that was supposed to be most of the plot. I then got one or two plants from a, from a relative. I didn't know what kind of pumpkin they were, but it's obvious that these are actually giant pumpkins. So I'll show you the leaf differences. There's quite a difference. So this is the pumpkin leaf of the small edible variety. See, it's not very lobed, it's not very big. And then this is the one from the, the giant variety. See, it's very lobed leaf and it's, it's absolutely huge, that leaf. So that one's actually starting to take over everything because it is such a big pumpkin. And you can see here, these pumpkins from the giant one have only just appeared in the last week or so, but they're already uh, bigger than what the smaller ones are going to be. And there's there's quite a lot of them already. You can see there's, there's one there, there's one there, and there's a third one there. So although they're giant ones, they're actually surprising the large number of them in here. But when it comes to the small edible ones, there's even more. So there's absolutely loads of them. We're going to have a really good crop of pumpkins this year. It's actually the first year we've grown pumpkins outside. It's a little bit cold in Scotland to get a very good harvest of pumpkins, but it looks like we're going to be lucky this year. June was exceptionally warm, the hottest on record. July was a little bit cold, but not too bad. And then August was a bit above average. And it looks like the beginning of September will be a bit above average as well. So the problem we normally have with growing pumpkins outside in Scotland is pumpkins like hot, warm weather. Our temperatures are only about 18 degrees as a maximum during the day, most days in the summer. So it doesn't have the heat that it needs. And then as soon as you come to September, the light levels disappear and the temperatures will drop right down and they get covered in powdery mildew. And then just as everything's starting to ripen up, the plants die off. You can even get frost in September and then you don't get a crop. But here in my parents' garden, the next to the coast, shouldn't get a frost in September. And the, the forecast for the next week or two, which is when all these pumpkins are going to be ripening up because it's right at the end of the year when they've set their fruit and they start to ripen. It's going to, it looks like it's going to be a week or two of warm sunny weather, so we should get a good crop this year. So I'll just go in a little bit now and show you how many of these small pumpkins there are. You can see down here, there's even three pumpkins 
all nestled in amongst each other. So there's, there's absolutely loads in here and everywhere I look, I just see more and more. So they're small at the moment. They'll probably double or triple in, the, in size. So that's the pumpkin patch anyway. I'll also show you on and off the different sunflowers. So basically I got um, some free sunflower seeds from a seed company because they used some of my pictures and, and what I said in the video on one of their blogs. So there's a lot of interesting sunflowers around. Some of them are my own ones that I've been breeding myself, like this one here, which is a multi-stem yellow variety. But most of them are actually from the seed company. I'll put the name up now, I can't remember off the top of my head which one it was. But it had a lovely selection of different colours. You can see this one here, kind of burgundy with like bright yellows bits on the outside. They're all multi-branching pretty much as well, which is nice, so we're going to have a long season of flowering. These have already been flowering for several weeks. You can see we've already deadheaded the first lot of flowers. The first lot always tend to be bigger and then they get smaller with each one, but they keep growing new ones out of these side branches. So we'll get a good two or three months of flowering out of these. So I'll show you, there's also some down here. This one here is called Wau. This is a very short dwarf variety, which is has multiple branches so this is perfect for this location this garden because it's very windy here these are short with thick branches these aren't going to suffer too much from the from the strong winds and you can see here we got a lot you get a lot of bees a lot of butterflies the wildlife absolutely love them and this small variety as i say as is uh multi-branching as well so we can see they're starting with their first flower now but they're going to have lots of other secondary flowers and then even we're going to have some uh more coming off the side branches there. So these will flower right through to the first frost. And that's about as tall as they'll get. They're quite small dwarf varieties. So I'll take you over now to another plot, which is quite tall, which is the bean plot. Now we do try to keep the plants of the same type together so we can do a crop rotation. Um, this one, we do because we don't need a whole quarter of the garden with beans, we kind of add some other crops that we can't fit in elsewhere. So we have here some tree spinach, that's this lovely purple plant here. This grows to about three or four meters in height by the end of summer. The leaves are very interesting. They got this kind of bright purpley bit, almost like violet right in the center there where the new growth comes out. A really nice looking plant and we just use that in salads. It's not the most exciting salad leaf but I, the colour really adds something to a salad bowl, so that's why we, we grow it. And as you can see, as it grows like, a, like its name, like a tree, it grows as a very large shrub. You can get a huge amount of crop with one or two plants. And again, it's low maintenance, not too many pests. It does sometimes get a leaf borer. We had that a bit in spring, you can see some there damaging the leaf. And um, it just kind of smothers the ground because of the height it grows and keeps everything shaded out. So not too much weeding with that one. Underneath it, we've also got some courgettes. You'll see them dotted around the garden wherever we've got space. They do quite well outside, even in our climate, so quite happy with the courgette crops we get. So the main beans we grow here outside are runner beans. The climate here is a little bit cool for runner beans, so we have to start them quite late. So these only just started cropping uh, last couple of weeks, to be honest. These can't go out until June or even late June because it's too cold in the ground and they'll just sit there and they won't grow properly. And then they don't start cropping until the very end of August but then we have a really heavy crop in August and September. So although this isn't the best climate for runner beans, because they crop so heavily in the last month or two, is that's definitely worth the, the effort. So you can see here, these are probably about two and a half meters in height. This is what I was talking about with the, the willow. We use the willow sticks. You, can, you can't really see them now because they're covered in beans. You can see one sticking out here, but these are the willow sticks. We tie them together and we make these supports and then we can have our beans running up them. So they're the runner beans. They do really well here, even though the climate isn't the best and we get a really heavy crop. So next to them, we have the broad beans. Broad beans are much more suited to our climate. We tend to grow them in, in spring. What we sometimes do with the broad beans is we overwinter them, we plant them in autumn, get a very early crop in May or June, and then we can transplant something else into that site and kind of do a double cropping on that site. This year, I think we cropped these around July, August. There's still some, you can see some down there actually. So there's still a bit more to harvest. And that's the broad beans, they do quite well. They can sometimes get to about two meters in height, uh, depending on the variety, but they often give us a very good crop. This corner, I think this is a bit of a, a, a mixed salad leaf corner. We've got some more of those interesting uh, sunflowers that I was talking about. I think I've got about five varieties, so there's lots of different uh, colors and shades coming through on them. This section here, various courgette plants, a small pumpkin which accidentally got planted because we thought that was a courgette. And then um, we've got this nasturtium here, which we use as a salad crop 
nice peppery leaves, tastes a bit like rocket, and also has these lovely flowers which are edible. So we quite like like growing this in the garden, adds a bit of so something interesting to our salad crop. And this actually just self seeds itself, so we don't need to replant this every year. The frost kills it, but the seeds survive, so we can just transplant the seedlings when they come up in spring and grow them wherever we want. And then coming round at the back here, we're coming back to the Jerusalem artichoke plot. We've got a row of carrots in here. These are a little bit shaded this year and we were quite late in sowing them so they're not very big but we've got a great climate for carrots. They grow really well in Scotland and in fact most of the fields in this area they grow a lot of carrots so they'll always do quite well for us. So we'll get a good crop of them later in the year. So the last plot here is the allium plot but there's also a few root vegetables as well. So we've already harvested all the alliums. They, they grow quite well for us. We grow garlic. We, don't, we sometimes grow leeks, not this year because we try to be less maintenance, um, but we've got onions as well. We had loads of onions. Half of this plot was all onions this year, basically. We've harvested them, had a great harvest of onions, and now we're planting up with some salad crops. We still need to plant this area. What we do is once we harvest somewhere, we smother it with grass clippings or any kind of plant mulch we can get our hands on. That stops the weeds from germinating and makes it much easier to sow the next crop because the, we don't have to do any weeding. So all we need to do is rake this back, sow the seeds in the in the nice rich soil which has had the benefit of the compost rotting into it from the mulch and then we can just grow the next crop without having to do much weeding. So you can see in here we've got some salad crop. One problem we do have is, you can see flying around there, is, is a cabbage white butterfly. So normally we have a brassica plot, but we've had a bit of issues with cabbage white and white blister. So we've not done any brassicas this year, which is part of the reason why this plot now exists. And the other problem is pigeons. We have a lot of pigeon damage. So that's why the, the netting is up to protect the, the salad crop. And then next to that, we have the parsnips. Parsnips do absolutely amazing in our climate here in Scotland. They grow really big roots. They're, they're thicker than my arm, absolutely huge. Um, and they're probably about two or three foot in length as well. So we get massive plants from the, the parsnips. These have a very long growing season. We plant these March or April. They're quite slow to germinate, but then they grow right through to October time. And then we harvest them anywhere from October till around March time. So these are a really good winter crop for us. You can see here, we've got some more sunflowers we got that one there with a the kind of pinkish colour and then we got the kind of burgundy and yellow one as well, multi-branched. And then in the middle, the only plant to really note is the, um, the shoe fly plant here. This is known as Nicandra physaloides. It's not a native plant, it's not edible, it's actually quite poisonous, but it self seeds and we quite like the flowers, so we just let it, let it grow. It's a very unusual looking plant, it's got these nice blue flowers, like, you, like this one here. But then once the flowers are finished, you get these lovely seed heads its form and just they're quite an attractive looking plant so this isn't invasive here in Scotland it doesn't like the frost the seeds can survive the winter but generally it doesn't self seed all that well but if you're in a warmer climate or a climate with mild winters you definitely probably don't want to have this in your garden because the seeds will grow everywhere and it can be quite invasive and we have had problems in the past in the polytunnel where it's self seeded and it's just kind of taken over a bit so that's a nice looking plant but maybe a bit invasive for some climates. So the only other thing to show you here in the vegetable plot is the eucalyptus here. So I planted this, I think it was around seven years ago now. It was a very small plant, less than a foot tall. And as you can see, it's a nice size eucalyptus tree. It is a very fast growing tree, even here in this climate, but it is very heavily stunted. This isn't the shape that you should normally see a eucalyptus for this at this age. This should be much taller and thinner but because of the strong winds we have the top keeps getting burnt off by the winds and so it's become a much bushier plant and much thicker stemmed as well. The other problem we have is because the winds are so strong we have a lot of defoliation on this so this is supposed to be an evergreen. This is eucalyptus gunnii which is one of the more cold hardy and wind tolerant eucalyptus plants but it still really struggles here in this garden. Basically, if the plant isn't herbaceous or deciduous, it gets a lot of damage in the winter. Even our conifer hedges around here get browned off sometimes. So anything that's not deciduous is quite at risk of getting leaf damage in the winter. Now, every other year this loses all its leaves if it's a bad winter. And then what happens is it really struggles the next year because it has to grow all its leaves new. So it grows lots of new leaves by around June, July time and then it puts on a tiny bit of growth and then winter comes and it gets defoliated again. This year we were really lucky, last winter wasn't too bad for storms, it had a full set of leaves. 
it then could put on lots of strong growth in summer and it's been growing strong ever since so this is looking really good it's probably put on about two or three foot this summer which normally as i say it, it kind of stops it doesn't get any taller it, it did grow quickly up to around about this height in about three years and then it kind of stayed at that height because of the, the wind damage because basically the height of the houses around here are probably around this height so once the, any plant gets to that height the wind just starts damaging it and it strugg struggles to get any taller but I'm quite happy with how the eucalyptus is doing. So the only other real vegetables we have would probably be the rhubarb, if, if you can count that as a vegetable. This is the rhubarb patch. Rhubarb does very well here in Scotland. And you can actually see this isn't a very sunny location. It gets quite a bit of shade at midday and it still grows really well. So that's the rhubarb patch. So that's the end of this part of the garden tour of my parents' garden. Part two will come out shortly and that video will mainly be looking at the other plants in the outside part of the garden and also looking at the vegetables in the greenhouse and also the polytunnel.